Howdy folks. Hopefully that will do it. Just had to restart the machine actually. I have the tea. How is everyone this evening? For those of you that are in the evening, that is. is good it looks okay at the moment which is nice audio looks okay but let me know Just updating some software whilst I'm uh, waiting for everyone. Just in case I need to use the uh, pad here. I did have one idea of um, maybe covering some stuff, given the conversation I had earlier on Discord. We had, should I say. That little update requires a wine update, which also requires the remarkable update. Which seems to be quite large. Don't know if it has to restart the end of this. Hopefully not. Not a system restart anyhow. agreement. I need to agree this. How, how, how do I accept this? I accept the license. Really? How do I do that? This is weird. Oh, is that like a tick box or something? Yeah. Installing some more stuff. Oh, is that done? Okay, I think that's updated, so that should work. I wonder if I need to update the Wi-Fi on here. Just bear with me, folks. I don't even know if I'm going to need this, but it's just one idea I had. 
let's just check the Wi-Fi. I think I've changed the password on the Wi-Fi since um, since it's last connected. It's just connecting. Should fail here and ask me for the password. <laughs> didn't. All right, let's forget these ones. Connecting, hold on. Hopefully this will do all the trick. Mean it's connected or not? Can't quite work it out. This is a bit strange. Let me know if the audio is okay, folks. Just trying to connect to the Wi Fi on this in case I need to use it later. This is very strange. I cannot see. I wonder what happens here. Let me just try something. There we go. Let's see if I can share this screen. It seems to be working, it's really strange. It didn't exactly tell me it was working. Yep, it works. Okay, we're ready to rock. With that, if we need be. Good evening, everyone. Please let me know how my audio levels are. They look good from this side. How are we all this evening? Audio is fine, says Laurie. Good. Um, so 
I'd like to talk about Verilog and Amaranth a bit later, but before we do that, I wanted to go through <clears throat> the system and naming as is, because there was certainly a bit of confusion earlier online when we were chatting about certain things. So it might be worth just stressing what is what, particularly given the changes of names and things over the last few months. Maybe a little confusing. Let me see if I can share the. Um... Screen. Let me just take that off for the moment. And turn on. This one. Uh... One second, it's not that one, it's this one. <clears throat> so, before we go on and talk about other bits and bobs, I want to do a quick once over on this. Um, kind of a quick overview of terms and stuff um, and mm, let me see if I can just enlarge this just slightly <clears throat> so what I want to cover this evening, I mean it's a bit of an open floor, but I want to just go through some basic terms that we're using in naming and the parts, just so that everybody um, understands the pieces of the equation that make up um, Black Edge as a system. Um, I've also I also want to talk about power um, on the um, on the ice logic bus and also that's power to tiles and also we need to cover talk about Verilog and Amaranth which is what we were talking about earlier on um, Discord and we just need to extend that conversation and go over that and review it because it's quite important. But perhaps before we do that, let's just do a refresh on where we are. Um, you can see down below, um, <clears throat> we have um, the product of uh, interest, let's say. Um, from a hardware point of view, that is made up of uh, some components. So in the middle, you can think of it as a kind of product sandwich, or as they used to um, humor us with, the uh, kind of Oreo. Um, and in the Oreo sense, this is the creamy bit in the middle. This is the Ice Logic bus. Uh, formerly, the Ice Logic deck so that had a bit of a name check. Uh, name change um, 
And this on the top here has the mezzanine layer and it has all of the uh, bigger surface mount components, including most importantly, the FPGA in the center there. In this case, this is a, a nice 40 HX series, uh, BGA packaged. It also contains things like uh, the power supply, a couple of switch modes, that's useful for producing the lower voltages from a five volt source such as three volt three for the logic and 1.2 for the core and PLLs that operate on the FPGA. Um, there is an additional source of power at the bottom here, which is for the tiles. Um, that's where the USB and power delivery goes. And there's also a separate connector here and we're gonna mention that a bit later as well and go over that. But this is the middle of that sandwich that we're uh, referring to, and this is called the ICE Logic Bus. So it's the thing that does the clever stuff. This provides the IOs for the tiles. So the tiles go on the bottom of this, which is why you can see those four uh, surface mount connectors there, 1.27 pitch mill pitch 1.27 mil pitch and then on the top you have what we used to call the mezzanine connector uh, this is actually um, we're now referring to this as black edge or black edge NXT to be precise and what goes on top of that is something like this this is the uh, this is an STM32 board that sits on top of that and this has uh, an STM32 F7 on it also uses some of the FPGA IOs that come up through the mezzanine to create the blade sockets which you see here There's three of them on the right one two three these just look like SD cards then there's a fourth one on this side, and then there's a regular S um, sorry, MMC connector, which is connected to the microcontroller on this side. And at the moment, we've got a USB here, um, and we've also got some flash, hyper flash, and hyper RAM. And that's what's on this board. And the two of these pieces work together. Um, uh, this is eventually going to be called the black ice sorry the black edge and then a description which will define what's on the board and then the thing that go on the bottom are things like these tiles and they go underneath on here and clip on we can have a double tile, which is kind of two tiles together. That's the prototype one, etc. So that's the stack. Tiles at the bottom, Ice Logic bus in the middle. That's the cream of the Oreo sandwich. And then a systems board on top, a Black Edge compatible systems board. Um, that is normally got a microcontroller and or uses the extra uh, FPGA IOs that aren't used for the tiles. And normally there's an umbilical link between the two. In this case, what we're talking about is QSPI, or Quad SPI uh, link between the two. Um, I see uh, Laurie's just pointing out that there's a uh, confusing name for a repository, and that will change. Um, we, we might be able to do that tonight, actually. So anyhow, if we look at it from a systems point of view, we kind of got a microcontroller up here, which is, in this case, it's an STM32. Uh, F7. Now F7 is a higher end um, 
32-bit ARM core with things such as floating points. It also has caches and stuff like that. It's high performance. This one runs at about 216 megahertz. Um, also attached to this, we've got some internal flash, obviously, but we've got some external spy flash here. Which we use for storage purposes, such as storing the uh, FPGA configurations. <clears throat> the other thing that we're using the microcontroller for is uh, ADCs, and those are connected down onto the tile. There's also a few GPIOs that go to the tile provide low bandwidth I.O. And then connected down to the FPGA itself, we have a QSPI link, quad SPI, that enables us to communicate between the STM32 microcontroller. And in this case, it's the ICE and it's a HX series. Coming off here we have um, some blades times four in this case. The other thing that we've got on the MCU I forgot is there is a um, MMC slash SD card interface. Uh, these are blades. They're actually called micro blades, but we just nickname them blades. Uh, and blades, by the way, if you haven't seen them before, are these kind of teeny tiny small plug-in boards. Um, like this one, this is a LED board and that We'll just go into one of the blade slots. On this board, thus, there you go. And we can do up to four of those. One, two, three, four. Um, In addition to that, we have uh, the PSU section. And there's two parts to this. There's a 3 volt 3 and a 1 volt 2. 1 volt 2 is primarily for the ICE 40 PLL and 3 volt 3 is for both. And the other thing on the STM32 is a uh, is a USB in which we can use to communicate with the host. Um, we also get the power to the PSU here, which is 5 volts. Oops, that's terrible. That comes from the USB. In addition, on the power supply, we've got this uh, higher voltage and power delivery, both of which can go into here to supply the power supply. And then at the bottom here we have tiles. Times four. And each tile has 12 uh, high performance IO 
from the FPGA, two ADCs, and at least one general purpose IO from the microcontroller, and I2C, and a couple of gen general shared signals such as reset and enable. He's pinging me now. Somebody's pinging me. Don't quite know who. Weird. Um. Oh, I think that's just iPost coming onto Discord. Welcome, iPost. Um, that's a hardware. Have I forgotten anything on here? Um, don't think I have. There's also an FPC connector on here, which we might use for display purposes. Um, that is, if you like, the hardware diagram of this. Um, I don't think I've forgotten anything else. I'd better just double check. There's some LEDs as well, so there's a there's a status LED and one that can be blinked. It's an RGB LED. And also the microcontroller has an LED RGB. So that's the hardware stack that we're talking about. The um, physical connection between the microcontroller board and the uh, ICE 40 HX, um, which contains the IO, etc., is black edge. In fact, it's a version of black edge called black edge next because there was a previous version that we used on the black ice MX. So that's the hardware stack. If there's any questions far away, oh, yes, there's an interrupt pin. Good point. All right, I'll put that in there. Um, int. In fact, let me get rid of where it says black edge. That's just going to clutter things up. You put the interrupt. Yeah. I post, by the way, we're just going through, we're just doing a system level review of everything so people will know what things are and where they are. I mean, it, it became obviously obvious to me earlier when we were having these discussions on Discord that some of the name changes and things have confused people and it wouldn't be a bad idea just to do a quick refresh so everybody knows where things are and what the various different parts are. So the board at the top with the microcontroller and the blades, that's the top of the Oreo and then in the centre you have the cream which is the ICE 40 and the power supplies and the power delivery and the higher voltages and higher power for the uh, tiles and then below that you've got the individual tiles which form the bottom of the Oreo, if you like. There's also a clock pin. Yes, very good. I'm going to have to do a curly one for that. Oops, in fact, that's one way. That way. Clock. 
So the purpose of the clock pin here is um, any HDL needs a clock. The i40 does not have an, an internal clock that's reliable enough. I think it has an, a soft clock. I think it might have a low frequency clock and a high frequency clock, but they're not crystal based. Because the microcontroller has two crystals on it, which I also haven't included. Um, <laughs> they should probably mark those on. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. It's complicated very quickly. Um, so yes, we have uh, two clocks. We have an RTC, you know, like a 32K. And we have a um, 25 megahertz clock. Um, so the microcontroller has a micro has a clock output facility that can either go through a PLL or can go directly out from the systems bus, um, and we're using that to generate the clock for the FPGA, so that the FPGA has a nice clock input. So that's there as well, and that comes down from the black edge connectors, the mezzanine connectors. Um, I think we've ticked all the boxes now. Oh, no, we haven't. No, we haven't. Thank you. Uh, the other thing that we have that sits on the um, this board at the top, I did mention it when I was going through the hardware components on there, is this important bit here in front of my thumb, which is HyperFlash and HyperRAM. Which is connected to the FPGA. So there's basically a um, hyperbus. Between these two. So you've got flash and RAM. And the hyperbus. Thanks, Laurie. Do you think we've now covered the hardware? We go into software. think just in case I've missed anything here ah I'll tell you what else there is there's a debug header and we're running out of room really here let's just make this a bit smaller and we can fill it in honey I shrunk the ADC let's have ADC and then here Got debug, which is SWDIO and SW clock and SWO. Uh, yeah, Laurie says we're missing the XT30 connection. So let me just show you. I did actually mark that down here. That's uh, this one here. But that's a good chance just to stop with the drawing for a second because I have finally received 
these lovely little connectors. I wonder if I can zoom in on these and you can get a look to see what these are like. There we go. And then the other end of these You can take, you know, like a battery lead that has the battery side of that. And then these two go together. Thus, one plugs in the other. It's not really focusing very well on that. So yeah, they finally came. I love the way these fit in. These are really good. I really do like these. Let me just put this one back. So just as an interlude before we get more onto the diagramming and stuff. Let's just make sure that these do actually fit. I'm sure getting these back in the um, bag now. I'll sort that out later. So let me just quickly uh, disconnect this stuff. And free off this board. Did you, so here you can see the sandwich that we were just talking about. We have the microcontroller board on top, the ice bus in the centre. You can tell that one that has these uh, prongs and creates these apertures, which you can see going on here. You can see the tiles underneath poking up through these gaps. So if you look carefully, what you've got here is you've got a VGA tile and a seven segment tile. Those are fitted on from the bottom upwards. So that's the uh, bottom layer and you can get a look in there. And then you can see from the bottom, I've got a double prototype tile and two single tiles on here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take off, um, let me just disconnect. I've also got a little blade here for an OLED. LCD screen, which I've just taken out as well. The thing that I want to do here is take off, if I can, take out the LED blade. This is actually rather tight. I need to be a bit careful here because I've got the tiles on as well. So I'm taking off my top microcontroller board now, yeah, because what I want to do is and show you where this fits in, and that fits nicely. Can you see it on the right hand side there? If I just put in. That's where it fits. What's more, it's the right way round. There you go. See it now. In action, so to speak.
And what I want to check is that when this goes back together, just put my more powerful glasses on and give myself a bit more light because this can be a bit fiddly getting these two together. I mean on yours it will be easier because it'd be less tight. When I put this together on my board here I had a bit of an issue actually and the angle of these mezzanine black edge connectors wasn't quite as aligned as I hoped. But now you can still see the connector in there and it fits snugly under there. It's not contacting at all, it's actually just in front of it. But here's the test. So if we now use the blade that sits above there, does the blade still go in or do we have a problem? And I think Houston we have a problem there I'm glad we've caught it this is something I was worried about look can you see what's happening there with the blade I haven't inserted that all the way in yet because can you see how it's resting on top of that connector we've just added and that it's that it's at an angle more importantly and it's actually pointing upwards which would indicate that that is going to be I mean it just goes in but in going in it's actually scraping on the connector let me see if I can give you a good look at that can you see how it's actually sitting in contact with the connector on top Which is what I was afraid might happen. Too tight for comfort. Seems like it would add stability, yeah. Assuming there are no components below. Um, the other thing I'm not taking into account is I don't have any spacers between the top board and the lower board. And if I had spacers in there, would that be, would that lift it slightly? Because I think I've based my calculation on the height on the spacers. So in other words, this board sits would sit just slightly higher than it is right now. I wonder. Let me just let me get that out again. I mean, it would depend on the spaces that I used, of course. Let me um, just going to disconnect it again. What happens if we have a spacer? Give me a sec, folks. Just grab a few more. Um, 
faces. Not going to put them all in, just enough to um, prove the point. Oh, it's really weird that one doesn't want to screw in. I wonder if I've got a bad one here. It's weird. I wonder what's wrong with that. It seems to be fairly tight. some reason that's ridiculously tight. Anyhow, let me just ignore that for a sec. And... Just try and piece this together with the... Uh, I'm not sure if these are the exact right spaces as well, which doesn't help, but I'll be able to get an idea Yeah, those spaces are a bit too tall. Damn it. So with those spaces I've put in now, although the problem will be okay, if you look very carefully, you'll see it's riding high. Um, Bigger than this. This says, uh, yeah, these are eight. Yeah, that's too big. Damn. I did have some seven somewhere. Hold on.
Do do do. Oh, the joys of mechanicals. Right, hold on. So those are too tall. Says these are seven. Just going to double check, guys. My ruler says this is seven, but actually it's six mil. <laughs> Damn. That's annoying. So I don't have one that is seven mil long. I only have well. I think somebody's measured these wrong because it does say seven on the pad, but it's definitely six mil. Let me try these, but I think these are going to be too short for the proper test. Apologies, folks. Let me just switch to the um, uh, larger picture. It's typical, isn't it, when you want something? I've always got the wrong ones. Especially when it comes to screws and spacers. Uh, something there. That one. Well, at least this one's going on okay. I hope this one fits. For some reason, that one's really rubbish. Let me see if I can find a better one. It just doesn't want to screw on. It does not want to screw on. So, oh, that's having trouble as well. I don't quite understand why. Some of these are better than others. Right, let me see if I can piece it back together again. Uh, right, where's the um, glad I have my lighting lamp here. Light is important in this. Normally it's a lot easier. If I didn't have the tiles on, I'd stick them up underneath so that they would be aligning and it makes it easier to do. But I didn't want to take all the tiles off here. I think that's good. So if that's on there like that, Again, I think it's tight. I don't think that's helping us because I think that lets the uh, connection go all the way down. So yeah, we've still got the same problem here with those six mils. Slightly less, but it's still very tight. If you look carefully, yep. <laughs> See how close. Um, 
this is here. It's literally resting on top. So I'd say that's slightly better, but it's still a tight fit. As you can see, that's still slightly angled. Better, but can you see how it's sticking up at the edge slightly there? But we've got another mill because these are six mil and they should be seven mil these spacers. Um, that might buy us a bit more, um, a bit more room. But either way, this is looking slightly um, tricky on that end. Push it all the way in, hold on. Yeah, it's stopping it actually going in all the way, to be fair. Yeah, that's gone in, but I'm not completely happy with that physically. Can you see how close that is? Okay, it's really difficult showing things on this camera because it's all around the wrong way. Hold on. Let me see if I can. Give you a good shot of that. See how tight that is, how much that's resting on top of the connector. Hmm. Interesting. But if the spacer has another mill on it, we might just be okay, but it's still very tight. One to think about. One most definitely to think about, folks. Oh, lost my screen share. So I'm going to have to look at that more closely. See if I can find any 7mm connectors. Interesting. But uh, the XT connectors fit lovely into the socket and the polarity is right as well. So that bit's good. It's just where it might interfere with the blade. Um, we might have some options there. Right, let's get back. I wonder if we can get back to the sharing. Hold on. Uh, press button. It will continue. Okay, and we're back. Let me know your thoughts on that, my friends. Um, right, so we covered what we've got hardware-wise here, and what we were talking about there is this power connector, uh, external power, being plugged into here from a battery, normally.
So I think we've covered all the hardware on this diagram. Any luck? Um, let's talk about the the kind of the um, the full stack, to use the software term. So just create a new page here. Um, So in terms of software, what we have is we have the host at the top, which is a PC normally. That connects over USB to the STM32. F7 in this case, and that's running firmware that we call Black Crab, which is firmware that's been written in Rust. And this then uses QSPI to talk to the ice. Vtex. And this is running things like Amaranth. Generated HDL, Synthesis, or Verilog. So this QSPI interface is also connected to the four spy pins on the ICE-40. There's also a reset pin. So what happens is the STM32 is capable of putting the ICE-40 FPGA into reset and reprogramming it using the SPI pins. Those pins get reused afterwards as part of a QSPI interface between the two. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, we also have the an interrupt pin, and we have the clock. Between those two devices. Um, so what we have between these two things, in terms of communication, between those two, we can use an implementation called QSPI MEM. And this basically is a quad SPI, very, very simple uh, memory interface that the STM32 can use to communicate with the IS40. And normally, what happens is you can send, you know, a bunch of bytes. of which there may be commands, addresses, and data. Basically, it can send, you know, the simplest of the commands is read, write. And then there's about, in the default case, about 23 bits for the address and then in terms of bytes of data we just keep sending them until you know the CS pin goes back up because it's an active low signal yeah And then between the STM32 and the host, we basically have a USB CDC serial.
and we can use this for sending a kind of command address data um, interface in this case we will tell it how many how many bytes of data we don't have a CS pin here to begin and end the transactions it's it's just a case of formatting it in such a way over the USB that um, it knows how many data bytes to receive um, and these commands here aren't just the commands to do with uh, sending data to the HDL that we synthesized on the FPGA but we might also want to be able to send data to the SDM32 that gets stored, you know, in the flash that's attached, or to the SD stroke MMC card, etc. So the different commands control whether it's read write and what device that's going to. And then what we run up here is we can run Amaranth to give the simplest example. And in the board file, there is an implementation in Python that talks over serial that enables us to send bytes from Python after programming uh, and one of the command modes is the programming mode itself which is a special mode which starts with ff so from the Am amaranth tooling not only can we create and synthesize our designs and also run the simulations locally on the host but we can also have uh, data sent over to the hdl that we've synthesized and programmed into the um, ICE 40. So it's quite a stack. I mean, the stack isn't done yet, and we're adding to it continually, and we haven't done all the pieces, but we do have things working at all these different levels. Um, why am I talking about this? Because I, I realized when we were going through something, when we were trying to answer some questions earlier on Discord, well, there was some confusion about the naming and how things worked and what were the protocols, etc., etc. So it's a good opportunity to do that. And one, the conversation that started this was, uh, how do you use this? How do you use this stack in order to uh, program and um, use use the development system? So the old way with the Black Ice MX, for example, was very simple. You normally just wrote some Verilog. You then used a make file, which would then call upon things like Yosys and NextPNR to create a, basically a, a, an FPGA bit file, which you then serialized, sorry, which you then um, basically piped over the serial to the microcontroller which then programmed the um, STM32. Now in this case we're going a bit further than that. So although this is backward compatible with that system, this takes things a bit further and has higher levels on the stack for doing the more clever stuff. And that means that we can actually interact with the development board and with the synthesized HDL that we've created using Python because Amaranth has written in Python. Oh! Sorry about that. Um, because I hit the closed button. Up here. So all of this can be orchestrated in Python running on the host. And one of the conversations we were having is, well, if I'm using Verilog, how do I use this? 
kind of thing. So let me just catch up on the chat because I know um, iPost is putting some bits and bobs up. And iPost was instrumental in this conversation earlier. Um, uh, iPost has just done a rendition. Uh, if you look down on the uh, live stream, um, let me just create a link for that. Um, for those of you not already um, on Discord, uh, you will see that I post as uh, it's got a uh, diagram of what he's trying to do. Uh, he was he, he was previously using Black Eyes MX using simple make file, I say simple make file, relatively simple make file, using the older system uh, in combination with the Verilog that he writes for his um, Ranger Rick, in this case, RISC V processor. Um, give me a link to the uh, YouTube as well, whilst you're at it, because I don't have it handy, I post, and then I'll, I'll post that in here as well, so people know what we're talking about. Um, so what iPost was doing is looking at migrating what he's already been doing on Black Ice MX and start using the new, you know, the Black Edge development system uh, that he's received. Um, there we go. There's a link. I'll post it into the Twitch messages as well for those of you following along there. Um, Cool. Um, After Hours Engineering is his YouTube channel, by the way. If you just want to do a manual search. So, there's two ways to upload a stream. One, upload, and two, use QSBI mem. Uh, not sure what you mean by that I post. There's only one way to upload it. Um, you can either upload it. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. So I mean they're both the same method. Strangely, um, it's just you're using different software on the host to do the same thing. So uh, the way I post would have done it before, or anyone using the Black Ice MX, is you would literally take the binary file that you've created that has a synthesis that's going to run on the FPGA and you pipe that over the serial port you know on Linux that'd be something like you know forward slash dev forward slash tty acm zero or something similar and you just send it over there and it automatically recognizes that um, it looks for the header um, so it takes the first byte as the command in this case it's ff always ff in those files um, or you can use the python um, that's part of the Amaranth um, board file, which has a function that does that for you. Um, and that normally works by picking up the HDL synthesis that you've created within Amaranth and then uploading that as part of its process because it's a more integrated thing rather than having separate make files and separate tools, etc. It's all done within the Python environment. Uh, and as I, I post was saying, well, that's what he uses right now. And one of the things we were trying to say is it'd be nice if, if, if I post can start benefiting from these other tools that we're creating uh, in Python and around tools like Amaranth, etc. So Amaranth, if, if you're not familiar with that, uh, you can do a search on GitHub, you'll find it. It's basically a way of creating your hardware description uh, from within Python itself, um, rather than having to write Verilog. And you can actually mix and match these. You can mix some Verilog with, with the Python if you need to. Uh, and one of the conversations that we started off was, well, what do you do if you've already got the Verilog? Can you take that Verilog and actually start using it from within the Python stuff? Um, 
and which is the best way of doing that I mean yes you can still rely on the old um, uh, black ice method but if you want to use some of the newer stuff like for example if you look at the diagram there you've got the QSPI mem support now we have Amaranth HDL that handles the QSPI mem transactions uh, when synthesized on the ICE 40 and in the black crab firmware that's running on the STM32 that's capable of speaking that and passing data over to something that has the QSPI mem support synthesized into the FPGA at the time. So wouldn't it be nice if uh, iPost can start using that as part of his um, after hours engineering stuff. And that's why we kind of ended up talking about all the different pieces in this puzzle here. Uh, let me just check on uh, the messages here and catch up. I'm just going to do a swap over. Tea's finished. Onto the cold water. Hmm? Well, at least it's not lukewarm, it is. I wouldn't say chilled, but cold. Um, so, no, I'm saying QSPI mem does not work until the bitstream that contains it has been uploaded. That's right, well, because the bitstream has the image of the HDL that you've just created, which may include the QSPI mem. Um, so there's only one way to upload a bitstream, which is to copy it to the USB device. But you can also copy other data to the USB device. The data will then be the command and its data. That data will be the command and its data. And IPO says, so it seems that using Amaranth, then it comes with QSPI mem inserted into the stream along with any HDL you write. Well, that's not strictly true, I post. You have to use it just in the same way you'd use a module, module in your Verilog. Well, if you're creating some HDL inside Amaranth, then you'd have to include the QSPI mem uh, module um, in your HDL in Amaranth as well. It's exactly the same. But not only that, you need to specify you know, say you're creating some registers at the end of that QSPI mem, then you'd have to factor those into your design. Just the same as you would with a, um, uh, a Verilog module. It's exactly the same sort of thing. So um, I post is now asking how, what, what resources does something like QSPI mem take? I don't think it takes an awful lot, does it, Laurie? Um, when Black Crab receives a USB packet, yeah, yeah he's just talking. Um, so Black Crab knows the difference between when you're uploading an image to program the FPGA versus when you're passing a command address data type QSP I mem transaction and it does that by looking at the initial bytes kind of auto magically if you like which is why you can just you know use it like the old black ice MX because it's just defaulting back to um, the programming commands rather than the new QSPI mem stuff because it can tell the difference. So I post is saying kind of sort of like the MX approach. <laughs> kind of sort of, yeah. <laughs> there's no magic. Well, there's a bit of auto magic to tell the difference between when it's being programmed and when it's receiving, you know, data that's destined for HDL that's already been synthesized. A bit warm here. I'm just going to open the rear door. Get some air in. I 
By the way, on those uh, connectors, guys and girls and whoever's on, folks, um, I've got a few extra ones. I'll send them up as part of the update care package for the developer's kit uh, later this month when I've got a bit more to add to them. Just FYI. Uh, I posted saying I could always port it to system Verilog. You could. You can actually take the Amaranth and output it as Verilog if you wish, I post. Um, one of the things that I wanted to be able to do, though, was be able to open your Verilog design in the, our Python tool, if you like, that then both serialized it um, and connected up QSBI mem somehow. That wouldn't be auto magic. You'd have to import it as some sort of module. And there would have to be some way of uh, binding those two together. But I, I don't quite know how that works yet because I don't have much experience in pulling Verilog parts into an Amaranth design. But yeah, if you wanted to do it that way, you could, I guess, output it to System Verilog as a module. Although I'm not quite sure if you can just output a module. Uh, it might output several files, including that module. This is the bit I'm unsure about in making these two things operate. And whether it's easy to output it as a kind of module or set of modules. Um, or to import the Verilog in the first place and use, you know, the um, the MyStorm Python tool combination to replace what you used in, say, your make file. I would just port it manually, but that requires I learn Python and Amaranth. Not necessarily. Is the answer. I'm, I'm wondering if we can... I mean, certainly we could probably generate something from Amaranth in Verilog that you could probably then import in a modular modular fashion. Uh, any design in Amaranth can be output as Verilog. By the way, I post. Um, Laurie, what happens if you output that as Verilog? I'd be intrigued. I mean, there's certainly something we can do to provide a kind of um, uh, a Verilog output. Although it's a bit more complicated than just a module because you've got clock things going on. Um, I'm not sure if you can just output a module from Amaranth, so you might get a whole bunch of other stuff that are assumed. Oh, you don't know how to output it as Verilog. Oh, hold on. I don't think it's difficult. Um, 
let me just get my browser up. Sorry, it's going to open a million things now. Bear with me. Uh, You've got the idea. Go oh, Daddy. Stop the it. I don't want that at all. Let me see if I can find. Do I already have this open? Uh, language guide. Hold on. Platform integration. Uh, Hold on. Tutorial, I want to learn. Any Amaranth design can be converted to synthesizable logic using the corresponding backend. Hold on. Let me uh, show you here. Let's get the browser open. Let's turn that off. Let's turn Remarkable off. Let's see if I can grab this. Not sure how clear that is. Can I zoom in on this movie? Yeah, so what it's saying here. Um, This tells you how to. Any Amaranth design can be converted to synthesizable Verilog using the corresponding back end. So you use Amaranth back. Um, you take whatever the top seat um, module is, I guess, and then you use this. Let me just copy this. Um, let me send you this link so that you can look at this directly, Laurie. So basically this will output it to Verilog. In this case they're using a counter design that they've designed up here. But there are some things that you can do here. The signals that will be connected to the ports of the top level Verilog module should be specified explicitly. The rising edge clock and synchronous reset signals of the sync domain are added automatically, as I mentioned before. If necessary, the control signals can be configured explicitly. The result is the following Verilog code. So here they're showing what the output looks like um, from that simple example. And you'll see these kind of hints here that come from the uh, generator. So, I mean, the output isn't as bad as a lot of automatically genera generated Verilog in that sense. You can actually relate it to the Amaranth module. Um, the Amaranth um, implementation. It does add a bit more here. You see how it's adding the references to that 
part of the uh, model that you have in Amaranth. So there's some flexibility here, but I haven't looked deeply into doing this enough in order to work out how you then integrate that easily. But I mean, you can work it out. Um, yeah, and then we're into the automatic generation. So if you, I mean, I don't know how complex that example is, Laurie. Um, you probably got quite a bit in there, but you could probably output that as Verilog so that iPost can have a look at it. If you output it to Verilog and then um, maybe post it on a gist or something. Because it's very simple code to do that is just this um, obviously that's for um, fairly simple Uh, Amaranth class. This one. I don't know if you could just output modules. When you're outputting, can you output? I wonder if you can just output a module. That's what we'd have to look at doing is creating the QSBI mem in such a way that's easy to output has some nice break off points in terms of modular structure that can easily be integrated with other Verilog. Because you could decide what to put on the um, on the module interface by the uh, last line by this ports equal uh, term, i.e., this one.
I don't know if I can do that because I don't have uh, you're using a slightly different version there that's your own fork um, I click on my I expect if I was just to copy and paste that I probably um, wouldn't be able to um, use it not about checking your version of the repo out first Nori um. Nori says he's trying it Okay, from Amaranth to back import Verilog, yeah. From QSPI import QSPI mem. Top equals QSPI mem. Uh, then you're opening the Verilog file for writing and then you're writing it out. You're converting and you're adding uh, QDI QSS, QCK, data in, address, QD0, QD output enable, um, data out, read and write. Yeah, that, well that seems, that seems about right. What does that produce, Laurie? Does it produce something that's readable that you can throw up on a gist? So that um, we can have a look, or I post can have a look. Just while she's doing that, I'm just going to get a bit more water because there wasn't much in there. Just going to mute for a sec whilst you have a look at that. Okay, let's open this uh, just so this is what it's generating so the naming leaves a little to be desired um, we could probably change that somewhere in Amaranth this module naming isn't very nice um, So 
So it's created quite a few modules. Include a wiring module by the looks of it. This wiring module, of course, it's got all of these um, IOs associated with it. Some of which I guess we're not using. It's going to make it slightly um, confusing. Yeah, I, we'd have to do something to pretty pretty it up, and we'd need to think what to do on the um, on the wiring because there's quite a bit of wiring here. We could probably get rid of some of this stuff, I guess. At the end of the day, you wouldn't need to see all the detail, but you want to be able to use it as a as a module. So I'm not sure how we'd eliminate some of that stuff. Laurie saying, I think creating a Verilog or System Verilog version on both would be a better idea as it's not much code. Yes and no. The trouble is you then have to keep both of those pieces of code um, up to date, i.e. when you change one you have to go and change the other. But yeah. This, this as is, is probably got too much, and the naming would need some work. I mean, the pin and wire naming here is not very helpful, obviously. It's just numerically naming them. Um, there may be a way to improve it in Amaranth so that it uses better naming. Yeah, it's still pretty difficult to read. And there's a lot of wires in here. Yeah, it's not necessarily what I call human readable.
Yeah, that's pretty tricky to read by any standard. Uh, Laurie's talking about creating a parameterized version to allow for different data widths and address widths, etc. Yeah, maybe we do have to port it. I'm looking at the Amaranth code. It seems to me like it embeds SPI. Is that correct? Not that SPI is complex. It's not SPI, it's QSPI, um, I post, but they're very similar. It's just QSPI uses nibbles rather than, you know, it's four bit wide rather than one bit wide. So it can transfer much more efficiently. So there's only two clock cycles to transfer a byte instead of eight. It looks so much easier in Amaranth, but then it is outputting a whole load of stuff, you know. Not only have we got all the comments and links, but we've got the obfuscation of numbered wires and things interconnecting stuff. It makes it much more difficult to read. You could possibly do a. Oh, excuse me pretty version of the output maybe that eliminates the comments and stuff that in itself might make it uh, a little more readable but Um, iPost is asking, is there uh, SPI IP built in? There, there is in the IS40, but we're not using that. It's all um, designed in HDL, is the answer, iPost. Because they don't have any hard QSPI, they do have a hard SPI. Uh, 
Uh, QSPI MEM has its own SPI gateway, yes. Implemented from scratch. Or QSPI in this case, not just SPI. Oh, me. Um, it's probably not the most exciting stream for folks, I do apologise, but uh, this is an interesting area for us because we don't just want to support Amaranth, we want to support uh, folks using Verilog as well. So deciding how we do that is important. Having a separate QSPI module would probably make things more complex as QSPI is simple to implement, particularly in Amaranth. Yeah, I mean, it is simpler in Amaranth, that's for sure. Doing it in Verilog um, is a bit more complicated. And often when you do it in Verilog, you, you wouldn't use the more explicit state machine approach that we're using. So for example, if you look at, um, is it Imad's original spy mem, the way that that controlled state was rather different, um, but quite common in Verilog in that it was bit counting all the way through and looking for you know, a number of cycles through instead of an explicit state machine. It was much harder to read as well because of that, but, but possibly more efficient. Uh, if you was to see it in Verilog I post, um, it's probably a bit more complicated in in Verilog than it would be in Amaranth. But obviously if you're more familiar with Verilog then uh, it's easier for you to understand. Um, I mean, it would be possible to create a module that you use as a black box, as you say, where you don't actually understand its implementation underneath, but you understand how to use it. That is another possibility. So this is it in uh, Amaranth. It's a lot, a lot more readable <laughs> than what it outputs in Verilog, of course. But yeah, um, the key is understanding that state machine. And visually that's easy to understand here if you understand Amaranth because you've got very clear 
you know, uh, phases, abstracted phase names and stuff as part of the state machine. Often, if you look at a Verilog implementation of what it'd be doing here, it'd be counting the clock cycles. So these would just be numbers, which is going to be slightly different. You know, you, you don't have this state machine construct or abstraction in Verilog. You have to create your own states manually, and those can be very numerical and fairly deep. So the way that you reason about it in Verilog is going to be slightly different because of that. Do you have the link of the original spy, uh, spy mem, uh, Laurie? That might help. Because that was a was that written in Verilog? I think there was a Verilog version originally. That might be useful for um, as a comparison, really. Emards version. I'll probably find it actually. Spine up the Uh, it's the PCB code. Oh, I can't find it in there. Why does it take me to that page if it's not in that page? So is that the, you've called it spy read write slave. Is that the same as his spy mem? So you can see here shifting stuff in. Um, but then when you try and look at the state, 
you've got all this kind of more cryptic way of counting the cycles so you know where you are in decoding the bytes and stuff so it's actually quite cryptic like this I mean, so that's all Verilog, um, if you want to look at it, I post. But I remember when I looked at this, it was not straightforward to understand. I think the Amaranth is so much easier to understand. Taken from someone that has to deal with both. Obviously. It's pretty tricky stuff. And that's the spy version, not the Q spy version, but the Q spy version is very similar in that sense. Yeah, but when you get into this bit here, that's where it's kind of real complicated, understanding the states. I'm guessing I'm missing the part where the SPI stuff in the Amaranth code seems like a lot of the Verilog logic would just disappear because disappear of Amaranth. Right, folks. Well, I'm going to wrap it up for the stream this evening. We can certainly carry on this conversation down on Discord. Um, but this is certainly one area that we need to find the answer to in order to support the Verilog side of things as well. It looks like we might need a specific Verilog version of QSPY MEM. Um, and as I say, those connectors I've got, I will get those out in the update, but I'm not going to do the um, the care package update until I've got some more bits to put in. Um, but we do need to have a look at that, uh, the way that that blade and that power socket interfere with each other, whether that's okay. I need to see if I can locate some 7 mil rather than 6 mil spaces to see how much difference that makes, to see where it's actually okay with the seven mil or not so if it's not we need to change it um thanks for joining um and we will continue the conversation down on discord and if you need to um join us i put a link in uh on the um uh on the uh Twitch, Twitch version of this. Um, do come and join us because we've got a lot to discuss in this particular area. So, ciao. See you later.